All right, uh, Acts uh, 18.8. So I was uh, kind of reading this, obviously, early in the week, and, and, uh, and Luke seems to uh, can take these uh, uh, little paragraphs and events and kind of, uh, um, uh, kind of breaks, breaks them down uh, around the theme of the church in Ephesus. That's, that's what it's really about. You kind of read about Paul and his ways back to Jerusalem. We get introduced to this guy named Apollos. Uh, Paul shows up. Uh, it's maybe a year later, but these verses are all kind of crunched together. And Paul is trying, or Dr. Luke are, is writing, I think for this reason, he wants to get us to Ephesus and see what God is doing there because it's an important strategic city. We've been to Athens, which is the intellectual capital of, uh, of uh, the Roman Empire at that time. We've been to Corinth, which is the sensual capital. Uh, again, if you called somebody a Corinthian in that day, it was a derogatory term. Uh, it meant they were completely without any moral bearings uh, uh, whatsoever. But uh, Ephesus is known as the, the center for the occult uh, in, uh, uh, in the first century. Uh, this is the church that Paul writes to and says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against uh, principalities and powers. This is the church that he teaches and reminds them of these important principles of, uh, of spiritual warfare. So... I think what Luke is doing, he's trying, to, he's trying to get us back to Ephesus as quickly as he can uh, because we're going to have uh, over a year transpire in, the, in, the, in one verse as, as, we, as we get to it. Uh, the focus here is really on Ephesus, God doing the work, and then building a church that is incredible, this is powerful. Uh, this is a church that, uh, that from this one church, they launch out and, uh, and cover uh, all seven uh, districts of the province. When you read the book of Revelation, your revelation is written to uh, the churches of Asia Minor, all the churches that were started by this church in Ephesus. Plus, as Paul writes, uh, the church in Colossae is started from this church. Uh, the church in Heriopolis is started from this church. So uh, this is a church that was uh, tremendously used by God, and we want to uh, uh, learn, learn a little more about it and these principles that can be applicable to uh, our church today. Uh, a couple of things I, I, I can resist. I've got to show you a couple of slides. So here we are uh, in terms of uh, on the far left where it says Achaia. Uh, if you have uh, awesome eyesight, you could probably read Corinth. Can anybody actually read Corinth? It's like an eye check. I can barely read it from here. But um, anyway, the red line goes straight across. So when it says, and Paul sails and stops at Ephesus, and he just happens to have Aquila and Aprilis, uh, Priscilla with him, it's no small voyage to get across. He will leave them at Ephesus, and then he will sail to, you know, down through the Mediterranean to Caesarea Maritima. That's uh, just north of Tel Aviv. Uh, he's going to go to Jerusalem, got to report in. We'll talk more about this, obviously, as we go along. Back to Antioch, and then back eventually to, uh, to Ephesus. A couple, couple more slides here. Of uh, got to show you the, uh, uh, the amphitheater there is incredible. In the bottom, you, you might be able to see the outline shows the amphitheater and then Wrigley Field. <laughs> Anyone ever been to Wrigley Field? I just like, you know, shake your hand or something. If you're, have you been there, Tom? Yeah. Amazing. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, that's, you know, but yeah, the hill's 41,000. So uh, uh, put that in context. The law stadium holds 50,000. So this is a big, this is a very, uh, a very big uh, amphitheater. You can go on to the, the next. That's it. <laughs> next week, uh, the, uh, the narrative will, will uh, take us to the amphitheater where that person is standing down there. The Apostle Paul stood down there, and there's a riot in this amphitheater. So you'll have a sense of, wow, this is, uh, this is a huge deal. Uh, you can go on to the, the next slide. Again, Roman cities were very, very sophisticated. This is an unusual road that it bends. It has a turn in it because they were pretty much laid out like a grid north and south, east and west, but uh, yeah, you, you have a, may, maybe it'll help you have a sense of, of, of the roadways, the columns, they were lit at night, they had shopping malls, uh, it's, yes, I said that, lit streets and shopping malls. Um, you go on to the, uh, the next slide. This is someone's house. Obviously, it's just the excavation, but you can look at the mosaics and the way the walls are decorated. Uh, on the surface, if you saw uh, Ephesus, uh, you would be very impressed, and it would seem like a, a center for intellectualism. Uh, they were very successful. They had a lot of wealth and so forth. Uh, but again, we know that their, 
deeply embedded in, uh, in the occult itself. And go on to the next one. Uh, this is the library. I wanted to show you that because uh, uh, we're going to meet uh, Apollos. Apollos is going to show up, and we'll see that um, he's like the perfect guy uh, to come in and reach the Ephesians with the gospel uh, because he is from Alexandria, which boasted a library of over 700,000 volumes in Ephesus. And uh, <clears throat> in Alexandria, basically, <clears throat> had a, a relationship with each other, and they had great admiration for each other. So it would have been a big deal if, uh, uh, when Apollo shows up, the fact that he's from uh, Alexandria. Uh, in Ephesus is the temple of uh, Diana or Artemis. We'll hear more about her in our study next week. But uh, uh, an incredible temple and a, a very, quote, sophisticated city, but a city that's uh, uh, embedded in the occult itself. Let's get to our first point, verse 18 to 22. It's a pledge that will keep Paul from staying in Ephesus. So Paul still remained a good while in Corinth. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria. And Priscilla and Aquila were with him. For he had his hair cut off at Supercuts. Oh, no, that's uh, Cancria, excuse me. For he had taken a vow. Uh, and he went to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews... When they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this, uh, this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he landed at Caesarea and, uh, and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. After he spent some time there, he departed, went over to the region of Galatia and Phygia in order uh, strengthening all the disciples. So uh, we have this uh, Paul taking this uh, pledge here. And he's been in Corinth for 18 months. He's getting ready to uh, to leave. He's on his way back to Jerusalem. He's going to stay just a short period of time in Ephesus because he's got a, a designated time. He's trying to uh, to get there. What the vow is, why Paul took it, is uh, in some ways a little bit speculative, but it was probably a Nazarite vow. Uh, Numbers chapter six. Talks about the Nazarite vow. Of course, we're familiar with Samson who took the Nazarite vow. So that men did this, women did this. It was very common among Jewish people in the in the first century. If they'd been through uh, maybe a, a difficult period of time uh, in their life, uh, they wanted to uh, make, uh, a, in a sense, uh, uh, others aware of their dedication to God and so forth. Uh, if you if you did this and took this vow, it would be pretty obvious because you're not going to cut your hair. Uh, you're uh, not going to touch not even a raisin, much less anything that comes from, uh, from grapes. You're not going to touch the dead and so forth, uh, and a couple of other things. Now, this has nothing to do with, with Paul going back into the law. This is just Paul being Jewish. Uh, he was just, he's just a Jewish guy, and, uh, and that's what you do. Uh, think about when he went uh, into Corinth in writing later, and we talked about this last time, he says, man, I came to you guys in fear and trembling. He was so afraid that uh, God has to show up uh, at a point in time in a vision and, said, and says, stop it. Stop being afraid. I'm not going to let anything happen to you in this city. Uh, you're going to be okay. I need, you to, I need you to speak. I need you to uh, be faithful to me at this critical juncture uh, in time. Now, it's been 18 months later. Apparently, the ministry's gone well. And so Paul's like, Hey, I, I want to do this. I want to show my, uh, my dedication to the Lord. In terms of, again, why he does these things still, well, writing back to that church in 1 Corinthians 9, he says this, for, for though I am free of all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win the Jews. To those under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who were under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, not being without law towards God, he didn't do anything uh, that would be uh, sinful, but under law towards Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak, I become all things to all men, that I, may, I might by all means save some. So he's doing this because, well, it's a, it makes him accepted then by the Jewish people he's trying to reach. They see that even though he's with Gentiles, even though he's 
uh, holding these, uh, these meetings and so forth with Gentiles. He hasn't abandoned his Judaism and so forth, and it continues to give him a platform uh, into other people's lives. And Paul was certainly more than happy to do it. We call it a cultural adaptation. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the uh, pastor's conference a couple of weeks ago, I was, uh, I was actually writing, writing, <laughs> writing notes to Kathy during one of the messages uh, to point out the fact that uh, the person that's speaking was uh, a lot more pigeon than the year before, and a lot more than the year before, and a lot more than the year before. Uh, he's an upcountry Maui, and it's, it's just kind of interesting. I know, in fact, that uh, he was born in Japan, raised in Southern California. Japanese guy, he serves, and he's just gotten more culturally adaptive as the years have gone by. It was just kind of, a, I was just getting a kick out of, look, he's a good teacher. And, uh, and we, uh, anyway, we, we have fun compare, literally comparing notes and, uh, and so forth, the sermons and stuff. But it was just interesting to watch, to think about over the years how he's just kind of uh, adapted himself. And I said something to him. Hey, Rick, the pigeon's coming out, bro. He goes, oh, look at, oh, I've got so many local people, and I'm just trying my best. <laughs> it's like, you can actually talk regular English to me, Rick. You know, but... Uh, it's almost like he can't. You know, he's just so adjusted to the culture and so forth, which is an awesome thing. But um, again, that's what Paul's doing here. He's trying to reach everyone, uh, and uh, and he will use the the uh, again the freedom that he has in Christ to to reach the Gentiles. But uh, here he's taking a vow, uh, probably because of his just an expression of gratitude, what God's done there uh, in the ministry in Corinth while he was there. Uh, he uh, secondly uh, he uh, makes his report to the home church verse 22 it's a little, a little cryptic but um, like I said Luke really crunches time down verse 22 and when he had landed at Caesarea so just north of Tel Aviv and then gone up if you're in Israel and you go up you're going to Jerusalem Jerusalem is on a plateau it doesn't matter if you're east, west, south. It doesn't matter what direction you come from. If you're going up, you're going to Jerusalem. And that's what it's saying there. He greeted the church, therefore, in Jerusalem and went down. He's actually going to Syria. That's north. But he's going down. He's leaving uh, Jerusalem. So in verse 22, uh, we actually have the journeys from, uh, from Caesarea to Jerusalem. He does his vow in terms of uh, cutting his hair and so forth. Greets the church, reports. He then goes down and actually travels up to present-day Syria, uh, reports in with the church there. Most writers believe that he's there for maybe a year or so, and then he's uh, back off on his third missionary journey. But it all happens. His, uh, his stop at Ephesus is very quick. It's short because of the pledge. But he's brought Priscilla and Aquila with him, and they remain behind, and they end up playing a critical juncture uh, in the uh, the birth and the life of this powerful church. So let's get on to them. But we'd say it's a private instruction that Apollos, I mentioned him in the introduction, receives in Ephesus, verse 24 to 28. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, go back over to Corinth, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. So Paulo uh, shows up there in Ephesus, and, um, and we have uh, uh, several things uh, uh, about him in terms of description here. One, again, a Jew from Alexandria. I mentioned the library there. Uh, its reputation in the ancient world has a population of about 600,000, a quarter of which are, are Jewish. Uh, again, a very uh, uh, important city, and if you're in Ephesus to have uh, to have been there, uh, we might liken it a little bit. It's like when we when we go to Japan, <laughs> we're we're uh, popular because we're from Hawaii, 
I mean, if you just tell people you're from Hawaii, they, they want to hear all about you and where you live, and they want to tell you about the, the one trip when they saved their life savings and the one trip uh, they made to Japan, uh, to Hawaii, and how long they were here, where did they stay, the things that they saw, and so forth. There's this uh, connection uh, that's, uh, that's just there. Uh, and um, in a greater way, in terms of philosophically and so forth, these two cities are, are tied together. Uh, so Apollos kind of has a, an open door with the people in Ephesus simply because he's from Alexandria. Second, it mentions he's a great speaker or an orator. Our term is an eloquent man. Also a, a very important aspect to life in uh, Ephesus. Uh, there were schools specific for training to learn how to speak before crowds uh, and, uh, and debating and so forth. And so these things are very, the things that are very important to them, that's who Apollos is. Uh, he's from this important city. He has these skills that they're looking for and so forth. And then it says he's been instructed in the way of the Lord. Uh, that is, he knows the Old Testament. Apparently, he knows it backwards and forwards. But he doesn't know much about Jesus. We're going to meet some other people like that in Ephesus uh, here that Paul runs into. Again, there's, there's uh, nobody's running around with the New Testament tucked in their back pocket. All they have is the Old Testament scriptures. Um, you know, again, uh, it's going to be uh, 55, 56 AD. Paul's going to write to the church in Corinth. Uh, he's writing a few letters. Uh, but uh, unless somebody told you, you wouldn't know the gospel. You wouldn't have got it in a track. You wouldn't have heard about it uh, unless somebody uh, knew it firsthand for themselves. Uh, so this guy is mighty in the way of the Lord, but uh, he's still got very limited uh, in information uh, in terms of, uh, of, of Jesus, that he in fact is the Messiah. And oh, by the way, he died on a Roman cross. And oh, by the way, that was for the forgiveness of our sins. But the good news is he rose again. Not only that, that, uh, that 50 days later, God poured out his spirit on us as believers uh, in fulfillment of Joel's prophecy and so forth. So this would all be brand, uh, uh, brand new to him. He never heard it before. And our whole point is that Priscilla and Aquila take him aside privately. And they very graciously uh, begin to instruct him and talk to him. Uh, we see that in verse 26. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And uh, uh, very, very important. I, I can tell you, when I first started teaching uh, a Bible study not far from here over in Callahale Hillside in a house there uh, a long time ago, I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, Danny Lane just asked me to do this. I'm just trying to fill in for him. And... Uh, and everything, and, and uh, he's, he gives me one of Chuck's tapes and says, uh, just listen to this and then make some notes and tell him what Chuck says. You know, we call it regurgitated Chuck, and that's kind of how a lot of us learn how to teach. And, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, fortunately at the time, Kathy was taking a precepts class, and in that class you have a thing called a commentary. We didn't know what that was until she took the class. You have a thing called a Strong's Concordance. It's strong because it's like that thick. So if you lift it for a while, it becomes strong. And then a Vines Greek Dictionary. We've never heard of these books, saw them before, until like two weeks before. So, so she's kind of trying to help me and I'm going through this and I'm going and I'm teaching these studies and I get this one guy and he's coming and, uh, and he's a guy that would say uh, in the middle of my doing my very best to kind of share what this passage uh, uh, says and what it means to us, he would say, uh, I don't think the Bible says that. <laughs> it's like, well, gee, I don't know. Maybe it doesn't. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm just doing my best. You know, that's what Chuck said. That's the best I got. You know, and, uh, anyway, he was, he was just a real blessing. <laughs> and, then, and then, you know, I'd go the next week and say, yeah, I really... I really got to really make sure I understand what this says because that guy is going to be there, you know. And I went through the whole thing. And then, and then I make, make the mistake of reading a cross-reference, right? Uh, you know, something, oh, I'm in Romans and I'm reading something in Philippians. That's not what Paul meant there. <laughs> I don't know. It seems like it. You could be right. I, you, know, I don't mean, you know, so that was like every cross-reference. I read it. I reread it. I read above it. I read below it. I read the whole epistle. I, that, that fits. That's what I, it, it, it kind of forced me to, to, to work a lot harder. Uh, it would have been, of course, a lot more gracious had he taken me aside privately and said, 
I'm not really sure if you've got that straight. You know, and, uh, but see, that's, that's what uh, Priscilla and Nicola did. So foundational to this church uh, is a couple who are not only solid in the word, they're gracious. They're gracious, kind people. And even when somebody is, is flat out wrong, theologically, he was wrong. He didn't have it together at all. He thought he did, but not at all. They, 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 they could have really, they, they could have given it to him right there publicly in the synagogue, but they didn't. Uh, this is what Kent Hughes says uh, about them. He says, their method was uh, beautifully life-giving. Uh, they took the, the young man aside and ministered Christ to him. Maybe they washed his feet and gave him a good Sabbath and supper. They certainly lovingly completed his theological picture. Apollos of Alexandria at this time became born again, baptized with the Spirit. This godly couple's attitude made all the difference. The Holy Spirit can work with or without us, but he is elected to work most often uh, through his people. Uh, but, it, it, but it's to be in a gracious way. Uh, and, uh, yeah, sometimes we have to kind of confront about things, but do it privately. I mean, I, I, I appreciate that. I mean, I, I'm up here doing the best I can and looking at my notes and there's a million things going on. And, and, uh, and I feel sometimes that then the first service come up and say, hey, can I talk to you about Sure. And you know what you said in there? You, know, you might want to rephrase that a little bit. People can think you're saying this instead of this. Oh, really? Oh, hey, thank you. Yeah, I, I just appreciate uh, people doing that rather than <laughs> I've had a tapering here on a Sunday morning. Don't say that. <laughs> It's always a blessing. I prefer an amen rather than uh, the Bible doesn't say that. But uh, uh, this church is built around a couple that knows the word and is gracious in their dealing uh, with uh, with others. And then secondly, uh, we want to applaud Apollos himself. Uh, he's obviously a very brilliant guy. He has got a tremendous education coming from Alexandria. He is well respected by everybody uh, in the city uh, because of his eloquence uh, and so forth his knowledge of the Old Testament. Uh, but when they take him aside and begin to explain, he's teachable. He's teachable. Uh, he's listening. Uh, and he's tracking. And it all makes sense to him. Uh, and they're able to uh, lead him to faith uh, in Christ. And, uh, and God ends up using his life uh, in a powerful way. Uh, thirdly, private instruction led to Apollo being powerful in sharing the word. Uh, verse 27, as he gets over back to Achaia, which again would include Corinth, Notice it says, uh, uh, when, he, when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the, uh, the disciples to, uh, to receive him. So he heads back again, verse 28. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, uh, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah. The word refute means to put to silent. In other words, his arguments based on the scripture, not just arguing for arguing's sake, but his debating skills and his knowledge of God's word left his critics speechless. In other words, nobody could say anything. You got anything? No, I got nothing. <laughs> it's, uh, there, nobody could say anything. They were just silence. And then he, he would just continue to share. Uh, so a guy that was used powerfully, so powerfully uh, that after a period of time, uh, there were people in the church in Corinth that says, I'm of Apollos. That guy is awesome, man. Yeah, but I'm of Paul. He's the founder of this church. And they started this little argument, right? And then Paul's got to write back to them. Uh, in that uh, letter, he says in 1 Corinthians 3, 5, Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believe? As the Lord gave to each one, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God gives the increase. Uh, Paul says uh, it's not about uh, human personality and man's ability. Uh, it's all the grace of God for all one uh, in Christ. Uh, again, uh, this happens. Uh, it's neat to see. People come through our church. People are hospitable to them, gracious with them, uh, help them get grounded in the word through the teaching and just uh, uh, the experience of uh, uh, loving fellowship. Uh, and then we see them go off. We see them go off many times. <laughs> and uh, it's part of our pattern here. And, uh, you know, but it's neat because uh, God continues to use them in, uh, in tremendous ways. We've got a uh, one of the guys who was part of the church for several years went on a couple of mission trips with us and stuff. If you remember Big Robin, if you're back maybe 10 years ago, Robin's pastor in church in uh, Alabama, of all, all places. And uh, when we were in uh, Southern California, 
uh, we met and had dinner with uh, Paul and Debbie Allen. So Debbie, uh, so they kind of, uh, I guess a little quick background, Paul's 32 years in the Marine Corps, retired colonel, mainly what he does now is counterterrorism training and so forth, security kind of details and stuff. And it could go on and on. It's a tremendous career. Uh, anyway, he's uh, he's where he's at Pendleton. Again, he's uh, working as a, uh, as he says, uh, he works for Booz Allen. Uh, he's the Allen, not the Booz. <laughs> the best contractor, but uh, he's at Pendleton. Uh, but he's uh, always looking if, if he can squeeze it in uh, to be involved in ministry uh, somehow. And uh, he still travels a lot, uh, but he uh, volunteers at a crisis pregnancy center. And uh, so he's uh, just had a heart to do it. The Lord led him to do it, so he went down and volunteered. And uh, so they, they're going to put him through a bunch of uh, training classes. I read a little recommendation and sent it uh, over to him and stuff. And he goes, yeah, you won't believe what they got me doing because I haven't completed my training. And what he's hoping to do is counsel with young guys that are coming in, you know, with their girlfriends and stuff, and, uh, and everything, which is an awesome, awesome ministry. Uh, but he says, yeah, they, uh, they said, until I get uh, all trained up to do that, uh, they want me to do data entry. Because me, he's go, these hands, data entry, you know? Uh, and, and he's like, they said, well, you know, uh, all these cards were filled out uh, by a woman uh, who was very hurt. Uh, and she's come to us. Uh, we need the information in here, but we need you to pray over every one of these because that's a person. I can do that. And, and he, so here, here he is. But I appreciated the humility and a, and a desire to, to serve. And, um, and that's what churches should be doing, training people up, even if they're going out like Apollos uh, to minister in the, in the body of Christ. Again, the church in Ephesus impacted their community, as we'll see. Uh, it began with a pledge from Paul. He wasn't able to stay long, uh, but he left this beautiful couple uh, that was there that graciously ministered to others, and in particular, uh, this man, Apollos. Third, it's God's power that's seen in the, in the church. Uh, that's in chapter 19, verse 1 to 10. And it happened while Apollos was in, at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, In what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Uh, now the men were about twelve in all. And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some, of, uh, some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew uh, the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus, and this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. So uh, Paul makes it back. Uh, he's on a second, his third missionary journey. He makes it back to Ephesus. He comes across uh, these uh, uh, 12 guys. And uh, whatever it was about them, it caused him to ask, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And, uh, and of course, it turns out, they're, they're like Apollos in the sense they're kind of Old Testament saints uh, of the Lord. Uh, and uh, uh, they heard John's message. Uh, John was all about uh, the forerunner, the Messiah. Be baptized. Prepare yourself. Repent of your sins because the Messiah is coming. Uh, and they're, they're still waiting. One writer called them spiritual Rip Van Winkles. <laughs> in other words, they, uh, they kind of heard, heard the message of John and they went to sleep and they woke up and Jesus is coming God and they they kind of missed it and uh, don't even know that uh, that he was there. It doesn't take a lot for Paul to lead somebody like that to the Lord. Uh, when they heard this, the message of the gospel, uh, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Well, they were already baptized once. Why are they baptized a second time? Because uh, they needed to get baptized because they just now got saved. They just now became born again. Baptism is an outward sign of an inward work before there was no inward work. They had just been baptized, believing that God was going to bring the Messiah, but now he's actually, he's actually come. Baptism is important, and uh, uh, no, it doesn't count if 
you were an infant, yeah, unless you were just an awesome kid, you know, and at seven uh, year old, you read, and, you know, you heard the gospel, you comprehended eternity, and what it would mean to uh, all eternity without Christ, and you got to the pacifier out that she thought about the scriptures <laughs> and uh, recognize how selfish you have been with your toys and if you want to happen. But uh, generally, most people are a little older uh, before they uh, repent of their sins. Uh, and again, what uh, I'm making the light of this, if you were if you were baptized in an infant, that means your your parents wanted you to walk with the Lord. You know, it's. Uh, it's, it's not a biblical thing, but it is the idea of a dedication. You know, your parents were trying to do what they thought was, was the right thing, and that's, uh, uh, and that's great. Uh, so he prays for them. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. As a result, they speak in, uh, in tongues. And again, uh, we've seen this uh, several times in the book of Acts. Beginning in chapter 2, the Holy Spirit's poured out. Uh, they speak in tongues. And... Uh, Again, this is a, a language, uh, a known language that other people could understand, but they did not know themselves. They're kind of praising God, bypassing their own uh, intellect uh, in the process. And when people said, uh, I think you guys are crazy or you've had a little too much wine, Peter said, no, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. and gave a scriptural foundation uh, for what was happening in terms of their experience, which we should always be able to, uh, to do. Uh, we see the same thing happen, I think, in Samaria. Uh, we see the same thing happen with Cornelius. Uh, and, uh, and it apparently continues, obviously, because uh, Paul has to write to the church over in Corinth and begin to give them instructions on the use uh, of gifts because they were very much uh, abusing this particular gift. So, again, uh, these gifts, the spiritual gifts, are still for today. And we've covered that with uh, some detail in the past. So we, we just say again, uh, there's nothing scriptural that says that somehow these gifts given to them were supposed to end at some period of time. Uh, when Peter says this was spoken of by the prophet Joel, if you read it in context, uh, all of that prophecy doesn't get fulfilled until Jesus comes back. So uh, these gifts, these spiritual gifts will uh, continue through uh, the church age. Now, do all people, when they're baptized in the Holy Spirit, speak in tongues? No, Paul Again, writes a series of rhetorical questions, 1 Corinthians 12, 29, are all apostles? I don't think so. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Uh, do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? No. Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts, uh, and uh, yet I show you a more excellent way. Of course, the more excellent way begins to describe in 1 Corinthians 13 the way of unconditional love. So, uh, again, these guys uh, are pray, uh, they're baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they end up speaking in tongues. That, that happens. That happens sometimes. It apparently doesn't happen all the time. But uh, it does happen with, uh, uh, with these uh, men here. Secondly, God's power would enable Paul to remain there for two years. So, uh, again, in a, in a city with a, a tremendous occultic uh, interest and power around them, a tremendous evil, uh, Paul is able to continue going. Uh, and, uh, and by continue going, I mean working very hard. He's in the lecture hall of Tyrannius. We've got some manuscript evidence that shows the fact that, that people in that day in that city, when it got to be 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, they stopped for lunch, and then they basically didn't go back to work until after the, eve, you know, the day cooled a bit about 4 in the afternoon. So I don't think they called it a siesta. I don't know what the Greek word would be for uh, afternoon nap. I doubt if they took tea uh, in the afternoon. Uh, but they took a break, which uh, opened up in the lecture hall of Tyrannius. So Paul's a tent maker, working, making tents, but also, we said, working with leather. He's up at sunrise like everybody else. He's working hard like everybody else. But when everybody knocks off, then he goes to the lecture hall of Tyrannius where he preaches and teaches and disciples people uh, uh, for several hours. And then, like everybody else, he goes back to work and works till the sun uh, goes down. He works hard enough. He works long enough. He not only provides for himself financially because he doesn't want to be a burden to anyone, he's able to provide for Timothy and Luke and the others that are with him uh, as well. I just say that Paul's a hardworking guy. Uh, and he wanted to do that uh, so that uh, finances and money would never be an issue in terms of the gospel or people coming to faith in Christ. Uh, and he spends the days when other people would have been resting in the heat of the day 
using that to, uh, to minister and to disciple men and women uh, in this church. And then thirdly, God's power was seen in the results, as I mentioned uh, before, verse 10. And this continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia, this again, this is the Roman province of Asia. This is not somewhere in China. This is the Roman province. This is kind of southwest uh, Turkey of, uh, uh, of today. Uh, divided up in seven districts, as I said, uh, the seven churches of the book of Revelation. Uh, again, also uh, the church in Colossae and uh, in Colossians 4, verse 13, 14, Paul mentions the church in, in Heriopolis. So there's a, a lot of awesome things are happening through the church uh, in, uh, in Ephesus. Uh, it's happening because uh, it just so happened that he stopped there on his way to Jerusalem. And it just so happened, as long as he was there uh, for a couple of days or a couple of weeks, he was going to get into a synagogue and preach the gospel. It just so happened that he thought about taking a solid couple like uh, Priscilla and Aquila and bringing them along who were solid in the word, who would be faithful to disciple anybody that came to uh, faith in Christ. Uh, and they, they not only did that, but they were gracious enough to take a man like Apollos aside privately and instruct him probably showed him a great deal of hospitality and, uh, and the love of Christ, uh, and God uses uh, him in a powerful way. Uh, if, uh, but it's also because uh, they prayed for people to receive Christ, and then they prayed for people to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, something, again, that uh, uh, is missing so often in the life of the believer. Uh, Jesus said in Acts 1-8, But the Holy Spirit shall come upon you with power, and then you'll be my witnesses, both here in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. He said that to people that were already born again of the Spirit, walking with him, his disciples, and so forth. Again, this uh, powerful work of God not just coming into our lives, but upon us, a different Greek preposition there, a different work of the Spirit of God that gives us the power to be his witnesses for him. Uh, if a church is going to impact their community around them, it needs all of these elements. They lived in a pretty evil day, and so do we. And we need the power of God's Spirit upon us. Uh, we need to learn to be gracious uh, in our sharing with people uh, and look for those opportunities that God gives us. Fourthly, kind of an interesting little story we'll conclude with here. Seven men who are pretenders in Ephesus, verse 11. Now, God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? That, that's, that's not a good thing when the demon says that. Verse 16. Uh, then the man in whom the evil spirit uh, was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This became uh, known both to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also, uh, many of those who had practiced uh, magic brought their books together uh, and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it told 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. So these guys, again, the... Uh, and the, again, the pretenders come along because of the uh, extraordinary miracles. Uh, uh, notice verse 11, now God worked unusual. That means unusual. <laughs> means you're not, you're not going to find this in other places in, in the book of Acts. This whole thing of, uh, you know, uh, taking up, you know, somebody's uh, handkerchief and letting Paul touch it and then laying on the sick somewhere else in the city and they, and they get healed. You're not going to find that a lot. It's uh, unusual. Why unusual? Why did God move in that way? I think it's because of what we've been talking about. This is a city and a group of people that are, uh, that are deeply into the occult and deeply under the, uh, the power of Satan and are used to seeing Satan, the real deal, work in miraculous ways. You know, the Satan can do miracles. He can do miracles. Uh, and because of that, God does unusual in terms of 
the degree and how things are done in order to capture uh, the hearts and the minds and the imaginations of the people in, in that city. I, I think it's a little bit of a proof text uh, as to why we kind of wonder when we go places like, like India that uh, we see God uh, moving miraculously there on a pretty regular basis. I mean, they'll, uh, th there is no medical treatments. You can't even get a Tylenol, much less see a doctor. So after every service, there is a healing line, and it might have 40, 50, 60, or 70 people in it, and you're going to be there for a while uh, praying for people. Uh, and, uh, and out of that line, you're probably going to see God heal miraculously two or three or four people. I mean, people that can't see, people that can't speak, people that are in wheelchairs, that, that kind of thing. Uh, even me. <laughs> and, and, it's, uh, and it's not my great faith, I can tell you that. Uh, it's amazing to, to watch uh, God, God work. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, talking with uh, some of the other pastors I've been with, it's like, why is, there, why is it so different in places like that? We think it's because of the same reasons. Uh, the people's lives are so bound up in the occult because of the, uh, the, the, the idolatry, of the, the worshiping the idols and, uh, and so forth that they're involved. Satan is, is alive and well in a lot of those places. Uh, and he's pretty out front with his powers and, and so forth that he uses through individuals. And it seems like God, God moves uh, in a like or greater manner uh, to validate the message of the gospel itself. And, uh, and people don't always, when they're healed, but many times, uh, there do come to faith uh, in, in Christ. Uh, and I think that's what's, uh, what's going on here. So the pretenders, these seven sons of Sheba, uh, they're seeing the power of what's going on, these unusual miracles. And, uh, and as a result, uh, they figure out that it's all being done uh, in the name of Jesus. Uh, so they're in the exorcism business. Maybe they've uh, figured that uh, uh, maybe this would uh, give us a little edge on the next demon we've got to exercise. So uh, they figure that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll use uh, Jesus' name to, uh, to cast out uh, the demons. It works for them. It's bound to work for us. Now, again, uh, we're their Jewish exorcists. Sure, uh, Jesus talks about them in uh, Luke eleven nineteen when he says, uh, If I cast out demons by Beelzebub, which was their accusation, by whom do your sons cast them out? So, I mean, this, it, it's what they did. It did happen. Uh, it did go on. Uh, but again, the name of Jesus is not a, a magical spell to cast uh, upon someone. Uh, but it is a powerful a powerful for, force for us as, as believers in terms of prayer, praying in Jesus' name, and coming against uh, the enemy against our lives and so forth. And, uh, and I, I can just tell you from practical uh, experience that I, I've been in places where there were demons, and it is interesting when you just begin to pray and say the name of Jesus. Uh, they really do begin to, to flee. Uh, it, is, uh, it is very interesting. I, uh, uh, I remember the first time I went with, uh, with Danny, Danny Lehman, and uh, oh, I'm quick story here. Uh, so I went with Danny Lehman, he says, yeah, we've got to go and see this gal. Uh, we're pretty sure she's demon-possessed. Uh, Maybe there's someone else available. Just ask. No, no this, you know, I want you to go with me. <laughs> and, uh, so anyway, we go over there. I was pretty, I was pretty young Christian. I was, uh, you know, that uh, teaching the Bible study and guys going, I don't think the Bible says that. It was that, it was that period of time. And uh, but uh, Danny's kind of my, uh, you know, mentor and stuff. So yeah, okay. So we go over. And he, before we go in uh, to see this gap, he says, uh, okay, here's the deal. Uh, <clears throat> now. Uh, I'm not really, we're not really sure she's possessed, but there's some indication she might be. So uh, I'm going to talk to her a little bit. I'm going to uh, begin to uh, pray for her. When I begin to pray for her, I'm going to start, I'm going to play the blood of Jesus and the name of Jesus. And I just tell you, demons don't like that. So when I pray, don't shut your eyes. Don't shut your eyes. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to pray for this guy. You keep your eyes open. There's a bed. The demon kind of, you know, in other words, don't let this gal beat me up here. You know, you kind of jump in here, you know. So don't shut your eyes because demons don't like the name of Jesus. I'll try to finish the rest of that story later. No, no, actually. Yeah. <laughs> just running short of time here. No, no, no. Actually, it, it, you know, nothing, nothing really happened. It was just kind of weird. And we, we prayed for her and we just kind of, uh, she needed to see a psychiatrist is what she needed. She probably needed to be on some meds or whatever. She's a very strange gal. But we kind of concluded that uh, 
it wasn't a spiritual condition that she was suffering. And, but uh, anyway, you know, that, that wasn't the last time Danny called me and asked me to do that, by the way. But uh, uh, it is amazing the power uh, of, uh, of the name of Jesus. Uh, these guys saw it, thought they could tap into it, even though they were not believers themselves. We can say, greater is he that is in us than he that is in, in the world. And these guys could not say that. And so the thing that's like, hey, we know Paul, we know Jesus, but who are you? That's, uh, they had a bad day. Uh, the pretenders uh, are being exposed, though. Lastly, uh, brought a powerful witness. And uh, uh, we call this a very expensive bonfire. Look at verse 18. Uh, and many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who had practiced mar uh, magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of uh, a vault. Now, uh, a couple of, uh, first let me say, this bonfire was uh, was worth uh, five million bucks. Now, it gives you how much in silver? Uh, it, it, you can calculate it uh, today. It might be a little a little more uh, for today's figures. As of about 10 years ago, it was, it was worth about five million dollars. So this was, uh, uh, people kind of, wow, <laughs> they did what? But uh, I want you to notice who's doing it. Look at verse 8. And many who had believed, past tense. Who's burning the books? The believers. Uh, you mean the believers in this church still had books on the occult? Yes, they did. So did we. So did we. Kathy and I, when we first got saved. So did we. I mean, we got saved. We're all brand new. We don't know anything. We're pretty sure these other books talk about Jesus. We're starting to realize well, there's some differences between those books and the Bible. I came to the conclusion a little sooner that one of these is true and not the other because they are contradictory. I put my money on the Bible. I'm just I'm saying that as a, a, a believer that's a few months older than the Lord. Pretty sure that's the truth. That means that's not. Therefore, I'm only going to read that. That I just came to that my own conclusion. There didn't know 2 Timothy 3, 16 or anything. Didn't know anything about manuscript evidence or anything else. Just came to that conclusion. Kathy hadn't come to that conclusion yet. <laughs> and so the, the, uh, these uh, New Age books went from the coffee table to the back bedroom uh, to the shelf in the, the closet to the back corner of that, uh, that closet. But they were still there. We're kind of going along, growing in the Lord, listening to Christian radio. And, uh, you know, maybe six months into it or so. And, uh, and then uh, and she's, you know, and I've kind of made it clear that, you know, I really don't want to have anything to do with these things anymore. But at the same time, God made it clear to me that uh, I just need to love my wife. Keep my mouth shut about these things. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be the one that wins this battle. It's going to have to be the Lord. So I was just doing my best to do that. And uh, one day uh, it was uh, she had got up that morning and prayed, Lord, you want me to get rid of these books, then you you have Tim say to me, I think it was like, you know, this time of year, September or so, you have Tim say to me, let's have a fire in a fireplace. Now, we have we had a fire. We had a fireplace. It's unusual. Our house in Cunningham, but uh, I didn't build it. You know, a little more practical. But we had a fire. We had a fireplace. So you need to know that. So she was, if, if, uh, if you want me to get rid of these, just have Tim say, you know, let's have a fire in the fireplace, and then she'll know. And that's the Lord. I got to burn all these books. And later that afternoon, hey, it just kind of got chilly. I came in from my shop. So, building windows for a living at that time. I came in from my shop. She's cooking dinner. I'm over the the stove. Oh wow, this feels good. It's really cold. You know, we should have a fire in the fireplace. <laughs> <laughs> just kind of looks at me. And uh, that, basically, we burned the books. We did this. We we uh, we burned them all in the fireplace. These are believers. Uh, past hits, many who had believed, they are believers. But notice verse 18, two more important verbs, came confessing and telling, present tense. In other words, believers who had been involved in the occult on a regular basis, this present tense, it was ongoing, they were, they were confessing and telling their deeds, confessing and telling their deeds. I don't think it was one bonfire, I mean five million bucks, I don't know that would be a big bonfire. I think this happened many times, many times, many times. Uh, God was working in the hearts of people, convicting them of their sin and saying, you need to change that. You need to turn away from it. It's evil. Uh, you, need, you need to have nothing to do with it. And they did it, and they did it in a very public way. Uh, and it uh, impacted the city around them. 
uh, and uh, tremendously. Again, do, do believers still do that today? Sometimes. Sometimes. Spurgeon said, uh, let your let your repentance be as notorious as your sin. If you are, if you are a very well-known, notorious sinner, then, then sometimes it's necessary to be a very well-known, notorious uh, saint and repenter uh, of, uh, of those sins. Uh, we had a, a friend of ours, uh, again, going back a long time ago, 20 years ago or so in the church, Nelson Fumitas, uh, and he... Uh, he had uh, uh, walked with the Lord for a period of time. Uh, he had kind of backslid, started uh, drinking, using drugs and stuff again. Uh, his wife is hanging in there, praying for him, still coming to church. Uh, she's getting ready to, uh, to go visit her family uh, on the mainland. So Nelson figures, this is great. You know, my wife's gone, so he goes out and buys like a dozen case, cases of beer and, uh, and uh, uh, a few pharmaceuticals to go along with it and so forth. And, uh, uh, and then he's a truck driver, and he uh, he's, uh, goes to work that day, uh, and uh, he's got plans for when he uh, gets off work, he goes to work. And on the first kind of uh, security gate he goes through, uh, where he's got a sign and, and so forth to get into this compound, uh, the guy that's there says, oh, hey, how's it going? You know, I, uh, this, uh, this, is, this may sound, this may sound a, little, a little funny or a little odd. I'm a Christian. I was praying this morning. Uh, and I, I got the impression, you know, God kind of, you know, I feel like God spoke to me and described you and that you would come through my gate today. And he told me to tell you. I know this is just, I'm just trying to pass this along. God told me to tell you. Nelson's a big, big small guy. So, the little, little ugly guy in the front gate is very humble. God, it's not me. God told me to tell you. You need to rent, repent of your sin. You need to turn back to God. You need to get right with God. This is your opportunity to turn to God and walk with him once again. And Nelson just, he knew it was the Lord. And he just, he broke right there and prayed to receive the Lord again. Okay, here's the public repentance. So then he goes home to Haula. <laughs> he lives like in a little lane where everybody knows each other, you know. He takes all 12 cases. The drugs go down in the toilet, of course. He takes all 12 cases of beer and puts them out in the middle of the lane, gets in his massive four-wheel drive truck, <laughs> And runs over the cases of beer, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. There's this bunch of uh, bunch of flat cans and a big wet spot in the middle of the road, and then got the trash can out, swept it all up, and put it away. That's what these guys did here. And uh, a church that God uses powerfully uh, is a church where people are gracious uh, in correcting others and sharing the gospel with others like this. Uh, this wonderful couple here, Priscilla and Aquila. There are people that uh, recognize uh, when someone says, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Yeah, I did, but man, I could sure use it again. And they're open uh, to that. Uh, they're open to uh, being trained and being taught. And then like uh, Apollos, that was uh, teachable. Uh, and they are, they are awesome at repenting of sin. And when God convicts them, uh, they turn from it and turn to walk with him. These are believers. Remember doing these things. This is the natural process of the life of the believer. There's just uh, there's a lot of sin that survives the impact of salvation. <laughs> and, uh, and it's an ongoing work uh, in our hearts. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will purify us. Present tense, always ongoing. He will purify us from all unrighteousness. That's a church that's on fire for the Lord. <laughs> it may not be a $5 million modifier, uh, but it's something that's uh, in the hearts that other people are able to see and recognize, wow, this is a church that impacts the community. They did, and then they planted all these other awesome churches uh, as a result. Just the natural outward what God was doing uh, in, in their lives. Amen. I will follow.